Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I uh, I love this show because I get to uh, turn people on to a bunch of uh, of interests that uh, you probably don't normally find yourself hearing tons about if you're getting your information from like cable news or whatever you get to you, you don't get to hear that much about things like butterflies and insects on a on a regular basis and uh in in traveling a, around and interviewing so many amazing uh academics through the eight years of doing this show i've met so many incredible researchers and i've got to have people like barrett klein on this show that uh, so many listeners have have uh, found that they're way more interested in insects and things than they than they ever thought they would be. And uh, and so I always ask those people for other guest recommendations. And that's how we continue to keep expanding uh, our knowledge and the wonderful topics that we get to hear about on this show. And with that, we have uh, a uh, as someone who comes highly recommended from our friend Barrett, Emily Snellrude is joining us today. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you uh, introduce yourselves to the listeners? Tell people a little bit about your uh, title, background, everything that you do. Yeah, so I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota in ecology, evolution, and behavior. I'm originally from Virginia. Did grad school in Arizona, postdoc in Indiana, and then came here in 2011. And I work on insects mostly and try to understand how organisms deal with novel environments, whether that's through learning or changing their, uh, their traits or other parts of their development, and the various conservation applications of those questions, trying to predict which species are going to thrive in cities or agricultural environments and which ones won't, and what we can do about that from a conservation perspective. Uh, insects seem like such a uh, wonderful um, way to kind of see evolution in real time because you you have you have these big mammals that have these kind of longer generations that's hard for us humans with a say 70 year lifespan to really uh, see up close and personal. Then you have bacteria that are evolving so incredibly fast and you're kind of looking under a microscope or whatever, but insect populations are are something where you can, uh, I, I feel like it, you can kind of see these examples um, up close and observe them yourself in uh, in the span of a in a career um, quite well. Yeah, exactly. Um, I actually used to work on birds, and since a kid was obsessed with birds, really, really wanted to do research on birds. And then I started started to do research on birds, and I still love birds, but they're really hard to work with from an experimental side. Um, so. I designed in grad school, I started designing all of these experiments that probably would have taken 15 years to do. Um, and then I was given the advice of, you know, maybe you should work on insects because they're a lot easier to work with experimentally. And so I switched and tried a bunch of different insect systems and I still love birds, but I don't think I'm ever going to go back from an experimental standpoint because they... In one experiment, you know, we can pretty easily rear hundreds or thousands of butterflies in very controlled conditions in a very small space. Um, you know, they take a month or so to grow up, and then we can measure lots of different traits on the adult. We can cut them open and look at their brains. We can put them in a cage and look at how well they learn. We can measure gene expression in their gut. So there's so many things that we can do with them pretty easily. But they're also really, really diverse. So there are thousands of species of butterflies. I worked on dung beetles for a while, and there are actually as many species of dung beetles in the world as there are birds. And so across insects, really? you can, yeah. <laughs> There's just a, a lot of ways to exploit uh, exploit waste out there. Yeah, and there are many different kinds of poop, too. So there, 
I guess I'd never thought about that. Mm-hmm. You think of, you think of uh, the archetype of poop in your mind, and you don't think about all of the yeah, wonderful There's actually a lot of poop diversity. variation, um, and different different beetles exploit different parts of that poop variation. Um, Anyway, I love dung yeah. beetles. I've, I've had I had a dung beetle episode on like years ago, and it, and it's stuck with me. But anyway, I, I won't get you stuck in in the muck of dung beetles. <laughs> That's fine. I love dung beetles too. <laughs> um, but yeah, insects are they're so diverse. You can basically come up with whatever question you want to answer and find an insect that's appropriate to to answer that question. So yeah. Um, so. So when you talk about, say, a thousand different um, species of of butterfly, how how you're in Minneapolis, right? Mm-hmm. So in, in say in say a given region, how much diversity is there? Is it is it like um, uh, I know there's like, like some bat populations, for example, you'll you'll see a few different species in if you live in Maine or something yeah. like that, but not that much diversity. How how many different kinds of butterfly are you? I, I suppose it depends so much on the region that you're in. And yeah, everything but, in. I mean, Minnesota is not the most biodiverse state in the U.S. Uh, for sure. But uh, <laughs> but we still have pretty good representation for a lot of insects. So. Of the insects we're currently working on, bees, um, there are between five and 600 species of bees in Minnesota. And butterflies, I should know exactly how many there are here, probably 100 to 150 species. Okay. um, We did some butterfly surveys this summer on roadsides, and I think we had 40 to 50 species, so, but definitely a, it's definitely a subset of the population. Um, and f- well, first of all, where, where and when is like butterfly heaven? If you're, if you're planning a trip for this coming summer or spring or something like that, and you just want it, uh, it, you want to take in just the oasis of butterflies, where would you go? That's a good, it's a great question. I think it depends on what butterflies you want to see. The, mm. Some of the southern states, so Florida, Texas, and Arizona, have really nice, incredibly diverse butterfly communities that also get sort of a peppering of cool tropical species. Um, of course, then there's the monarch migration going to some of the sites in Mexico and just seeing the huge, not overwhelming numbers of monarchs there. That's a favorite butterfly tourism spot. Uh, I have to admit, though, I'm... I really like bogs and there are a bunch of really weird bog butterflies that um, are kind of specialized on bog plants and come out at very short for very short periods of time. Uh, One of them is in Wisconsin, the cranberry bog copper, which comes out in July. Uh, When you say weird, what do you mean by? uh, Well, it's just you you don't find them anywhere else. If you want to see hmm. cranberry bog copper, which is a pretty little butterfly they lay their eggs on cranberry leaves. And so you have to go to a bog with cranberries in it. And they're only out for a couple of weeks in July every year. You tromp through a bog and find these little butterflies. Um, Interesting. Yeah. (laughs) So, so you, you talk, um, or you research in, I want to, um, I, I want to just, give people a little taste of what we will get to eventually because I've I have a question first that I've that's on my mind but you you deal with a lot of um kind of our our modern environment because of human impact because of cities everything else it, it changes really quite rapidly compared to much of earth's evolution and um and you deal with a lot of how uh various insects including butterflies are adapting to some of those changes and and the changes in diversity maybe less diversity in some places other times creating opportunities for um more diversity and new species to take off Uh, but before we get to that I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the evolution of the butterfly, just uh, some basics for us, because 
I, I love uh, one of my favorite topics on the show is is lifespan development and even thinking about in humans and so many animals, uh, the 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 change that happens from um, being a, a baby to a juvenile to puberty to uh, that then, uh, you know, in humans going into older age and and uh all of these different changes that we face. And that seems like nothing compared to uh, <laughs> the stages of going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. So could you talk a little bit about how in the world this evolved? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting flashbacks to my prelim exam where I'll see, if I, <laughs> see if I can remember all of these pieces. Yeah, but it's probably been a couple but, decades. Huh? Yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you what I remember from this. So, I mean, butterflies are butterflies are technically moths. They're nested within moths, which are the order Lepidoptera and in insects. And those insects are nested within a whole group that have complete metamorphosis, holometabolism insects, And so these are, they have an egg, but then they have this larval phase of huge immaturity. And then they have a metamorphosis period where they completely reorganize things in their body and then come out as a different adult. Um, and there are some holometabolism insects that have even crazier metamorphosis than butterflies, like flies in general are, pr are probably the epitome of really weird where the you know you have maggots they don't even have legs they just are these like little grubby things moving around and then something happens in that magical people phase where they come out as a fly um hmm. they grow new they grow new body parts they grow new neural connections wiring those things together um and butterflies um so they have the metamorphosis period uh has been hailed as sort of an evolutionary innovation for a number of reasons. The One of the typical ones cited in the literature is that you can basically have the larval do, larvae do something special that's simple. They're basically an eating machine. And then the adult can fill a completely different niche and have a completely different set of traits that, that allow them to fill that niche. Um, and so that's sort of the, the story, the adaptive story of complete metamorphosis, because and when you look at insect evolution, when once complete metamorphosis happens, there are a couple of orders of insects that have just had huge radiations and are incredibly speciose. So beetles, Lepidoptera, flies, um, these are all insects with uh, um, complete metamorphosis. The big speciose order that doesn't have complete metamorphosis are true bugs, hemiptera. Um, but for the most part, the a lot of groups with complete metamorphosis are just incredibly speciose. So it seems to be beneficial from an evolvability perspective. But it's really hard to test that because it only happened once. This origin, mm. this origin of complete metamorphosis happened once on the insect tree. Um, so you could probably, you know, step back even further and compare it to different types of metamorphosis um, across invertebrates because there is a huge diversity, especially in marine invertebrates and types of metamorphosis. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the natural history of those groups quite as well. But, yeah, uh, that, that would probably be where I would go to test that idea. Hmm. And it, when you say complete metamorphosis, is there. <sighs> I, I don't I what what is happening during that stage is it just like in my mind it's just everything's turning to goop and then and then starting yeah. all over again but that can't be the case is, no. is there is, is, it's is not there... complete goop it's not complete goop there's a little bit more organization going on there there, uh, there has to be because there has to be some parts that kind of remain the right over uh, that uh, that kind of transfer are in both uh, right there are some parts that remain and there are some parts that start developing earlier in the larval stage um so for example in the lepidoptera brain the all the pieces of the adult brain are there but they don't really start to grow and divide a lot until the until metamorphosis. And in butterflies, you especially see this with the eyes. 
Caterpillars have really small eyes, very few neurons um, in the larval eyes. But in an adult butterfly, the parts of their brain that processes its vision is 75% of their brain. And pretty much all of that neural proliferation happens during the pupil stage. And from a brain development perspective, that's an, a great strategy because neural tissue is really costly. Mm-hmm. So it's basically like make a feeding machine caterpillar and you can make a whole bunch of them. And then the costs of growing a big brain are put on the caterpillar later at that pupil stage. Whereas humans can't do that. They have yeah. a lot more investment in the brain development of their offspring because we don't have metamorphosis. Yeah, um, right. It, yeah. yeah, we we just it, it's there's a uh, there's it, it, for a caterpillar is that I'm, I'm thinking of like a sea urchin that that starts out with a more sophisticated, it's the opposite starts out with a more sophisticated brain because it's moving around and needs to navigate. And then it finds the place that it's going to hunker down for the rest of its life. And then once it, once it does that, it, it, uh, or not sea urchin. What am I thinking of? Um, uh, is it? Submarine Uh, invertebrate. uh, It's yeah. (laughs) And, uh, but, but once it, it, once it sticks in one place, then it digests its own brain basically because of how energetically costly Uh. it is. And it's not going to, uh, is it a cucumber? Um, why? Hmm. It, okay. Anyway, I believe it, it, it makes sense. It, That's it, cool. it, it swims around to navigate, needs a brain for that. And then once it finds where it's going to be for the rest of its life, it's going to just basically be a filter after that. And then it uh, just digest, digest its own eyes and brain because it's uh, who, who yeah. needs that energetically expensive stuff anymore. In the same way, they, uh, the uh, that caterpillar, I, I, I suppose you don't need a a lot of brain to just sit on a leaf and munch away. No, you don't. And especially if your parents made a good decision and put you on a nice leaf or on a nice mm-hmm. plant. And so uh, there are a lot of in adult butterflies, adult butterflies, the females do a lot goes into decisions about where they put their eggs. And so the idea is put your egg in a good spot. And then the caterpillar sits there and accumulates all the nutrients they need grows that big brain later. Um, Amazing. Um, so, and, and then that, and then that it just comes out ready to go. Once a, yeah. once a butterfly, um, it comes out of its cocoon, it just, it's, it's ready. Is it's fully formed or does it continue to grow? Yes and no. So the, the, the main body cuticle is done. So they're sort of their wing size, they're not going to grow bigger wings. They're not going to grow longer legs, but there is still a fair amount of plasticity within them. Um, and in terms of their brain, there's a lot of brain, there's a lot of learning and sort of neural investment, neural growth that happens even after emergence, even in insects that only live a week or so. Um, and then there's a lot of rearrangements that happen later too, both in the brain and other tissues. So in butterflies, kind of like the example that you were just giving with the sea cucumber. It's it's a sea squirt. Finally, sea squirt. Okay. It finally got it. Yeah, it's a sea squirt just for the people Googling and wanting okay. to find out more yes. about that. It's fascinating. Yeah. So they'll, they will reallocate across tissues over their lifetime. There's some evidence that they'll take protein from flight muscle later in life and reallocate it to eggs. There's some um, be- social insects where they will shift their brain around, kind of like the sea squirt example, where the queens, after flying around and figuring out where they're going to live, they settle in a colony underground and they'll shrink their optic lobes and other parts of their brain Amazing. and reallocate that elsewhere. So there's still a lot of sort of tissue flexibility within the adults, even though their body sort of skeleton is set. Um, and so, oh, and I, I don't know if you want to go back and talk more about the goo piece, but. The- I, I do, I do. <laughs> I, I, as, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how much of my own brain has been digested over time because I, <laughs> uh, it's like, well, I'm not using that part anymore. You know? Hopefully it hasn't been digested. It's just been reallocated to other functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, w- whatever used to be able to find my way around while driving is now 
yeah. reallocated for other purposes. Um, yeah, let's 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 talk about the goop because I also want to know I want to know how long that caterpillar stage is as well. But um, yeah, but so I I guess I was just gonna add a couple more things about sure the goo bag of goo because I think people often think about the metamorphosis stage as a complete rearrangement, but as we were talking before, there are yeah. pieces that kind of go through. Um, the the wings I think and the gonads are also interesting sort of case studies for what happens there. So in a lot of insects with complete metamorphosis, they will start growing their wings and they're called imaginal discs in the caterpillar. And so there are they're kind of like flat at this stage, sort of flat proliferations of cells. The cells have initial identity for what they're going to be later on in the wing. And it kind of bunches up on each other and only later in development does it sort of expand. But that imaginal disc starts before the pupil stage and then it starts to get patterned and develop more during the pupil stage. Mm. Um, the gonads as well are also starting some degree of development earlier, but then something other things will happen in the pupil stage. So in butterfly, in most butterflies in males, the testes are paired in caterpillars and you can see them in some caterpillar species at the top of the abdomen. You can see these like little black dots through the abdomen, but then in the pupil stage, they fuse into one giant red ball. Uh, and so there, you know, there are pieces of it that are there that are growing in the larval stage and just more things happen in the pupil stage. The stuff hmm. that is getting rearranged are when you have parts that go away and then you have to move the neural innervations around so in caterpillars of butterflies they have these prolegs at the bottom so the caterpillar is this long thing there are these little prolegs at the end of the abdomen those aren't in the adult the adults have three legs on the thorax three pairs of legs on the thorax but the prolegs are gone so the neurons that innervated those prolegs to walk in the caterpillar go away um, and you can kind of see them starting to regress and then so they will regress things and atrophy things that they aren't going to use as the adult and so there are parts of the digestive system as well that will get rearranged that way too so i would say more rearrangement is a better metaphor than goo <laughs> well i appreciate <laughs> you indulging my goo sack characterization of of what's happening which i do to be wrong but it still just sort of feels uh intuitively it's it's just such an incredible transformation that if you yeah. i mean it if you showed someone that had grown up on a desert island or something and never seen a butterfly and you showed them a caterpillar and you showed them a butterfly and you were like or you teach a child this for the first time and you're like these these two things are the same uh, uh, thing just at different stages in life you would they would think you were crazy yeah i i completely agree it is incredible and it is incredible that even after a week or two in the pupil stage, the adult comes out and yes, more things happen in adulthood in terms of learning and rearrangement and stuff, but they can fly as soon as their wings dry and they didn't have any practice. They're good to go on a whole bunch of things. And that to me is incredible. It's interesting that they re retain, they, they have, they have the whole brain because the brain doesn't just turn to goo. They have it just kind of expands and and gets. I mean, not not to anthropomorphize. Well, it's fun to anthropomorphize <laughs> once in a while, but but what an experience to be a caterpillar. Not that not that caterpillars are self aware or whatever else, but what an experience to have that life and then hunker down for a while in a cocoon and then you come out and you're just like, oh, flying. Yeah, I know exactly how to do this just yeah, that's easy a really, peasy i've never thought of it that way but that's a really interesting way <laughs> to think about it you know do they wake up and have any awareness that they are in a completely different state that they can all of a sudden <laughs> do things they couldn't do before i probably i don't think they are because if you think about yeah. our own development you know when our brain was so different when we were six months old 
We have right. no memory of that, even though we mm-hmm. were aware of it at the pro- at the time. Mm-hmm. And is that because the brain changed so much that you just can't remember that because all of the neural circuits for that are gone? I I don't know. We're going into well, speculative that, territory well, here. But. That's interesting. Right, right. Of course, but it's a, it's a it is interesting to think about because if you think about a if you think about a a baby or prenatal development or whatever, the the perceptual experience is a lot more goopy and and in, in in terms of the there hasn't been the kind of synaptic pruning and the categorization of things and it, it, it hasn't uh, there isn't the the kind of clarity of perception or those neural patterns needed uh, built already where whereas a butterfly just comes out ready to go can easily identify what flowers it needs to find can easily identify a mate and everything it just fully formed and and ready to live its life yeah. um so well it, what what kind of um it, are there things that we can learn um about other species evolution from um this peculiar metamorphosis of butterflies like uh for example and if you don't have an answer to this question it's totally fine i know we're still not at what you actually research um but uh it, it in terms of in terms of say as you were talking about the wing i was just thinking is this an insight into how potentially uh, wings may have evolved in some of the early steps of wing evolution on Earth. Uh, 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 watching some of these developments in metamorphosis, or is that not? Uh, That's not, a really interesting a question. Comparison. I feel like I could direct you to some evolutionary developmental biologists to maybe talk about that because there are some people doing work on sort of evolution of insect wing development across really huge number, like millions of years type um, macro evolutionary studies. That could be a really interesting discussion. Awesome. Yeah, they've just evolved in so many different ways, so many different times. It's just such a useful thing to have wings that (laughs) that it's happened again and again, um, independently of one another. So in in terms of, uh, in terms of, offspring and the, the kind of strategy with with butterflies it sounds like there's uh uh you know the, the, there's not there, there's not much parental investment other other than uh trying to uh trying to lay your eggs on the on on the ideal uh plant life is there is it is it kind of a quantity over quality sort of uh, sort of strategy like with with most insects i imagine where you just lay a whole bunch of these things in a uh, in a bunch of different kind of do they do they lay on the like diverse regions and hedge bets or do you just throw all of your eggs on one leaf basket and hope for the best what what goes on there well that's that's a great question and there is a huge diversity of strategies across butterflies i would say in general, butterflies relative to other systems do take the quantity strategy. They produce, they lay a lot of eggs, hundreds of offspring in terms of eggs. And that's in part because the larval mortality is so high. Um, mm. Everything wants to eat caterpillars. Uh, I mean, in some species, it's 80 to 95% caterpillar mortality. Um of course, this I mean, this gets to bigger questions about ev- the evolution of parental care because one would say, well, your mortality would be so high if the parents stuck around and took care of the offspring, but that's not the strategy they use. Uh, the, mm-hmm. They s- instead tend to s- spread their risk across lots of different plants or lots of different plants of a certain type. So, um, and so they've done experimental studies in a number of species where. Females will actually pass over acceptable plants, uh, the idea being that they're spreading their risk across bigger areas so that if, if a predator finds a patch of plants, they won't eat all of their offspring. Um, that said, the parents, the mother is very choosy with respect to the type of plant that she'll lay on. 
plants are off, butterflies are often adapted to a very narrow range of, of host plants and they can deal with the chemicals, the defensive chemicals in those plants. Mm. So like monarchs feed on milkweed and cabbage whites feed on plants in the mustard family. Uh, pipevine swallowtails feed on plants in the Rusalokia family. Uh, would you mind going into the, it was actually going to be my next question but was was how how also the evolution of butterflies has also driven some of the evolution of of some of these plants it's the what was it the milkweed yeah. there's there's kind of like a, a basically what's what's kind of poisonous to caterpillars and sort of the veins of these plants that'll that'll come out to yeah, kill them or yeah. so i mean plants from an evolutionary perspective and to continue anthropomorphizing plants don't want to be eaten so mm -hmm. they are under pressure to evolve defenses, whether those are physical defenses or for a lot of insect herbivores, chemical defenses. And plants produce an amazing number of nasty chemicals. They are an amazing pharmacy for humans because of that. Um, I think over 50% of our drugs come from plants um, or 70% of them from natural, from the natural world in general. I can't remember what the statistic is, but plants have lots of nasty chemicals in them. And that's because they are eaten by lots of things. Um, and over time have evolved the defenses to um, deter those herbivores. And so a lot of the idea is that a lot of insects are specialized on certain plants because they're in arms races with those plants and they have the, mechanisms to detoxify the chemicals in those plants and they almost get locked in then an arms race with that plant um that plant group and so uh, you know cabbage whites are feed on brassicaceae and and the mustard family uh and the mustard mustards are usually toxic to most species they, uh, because of mustard oils and glucosinolates but the those butterflies have a specialized protein called the nitrile specifier protein that that deactivates those chemical defenses. And similarly, monarchs feed on, and actually all Danaean butterflies feed on milkweeds. Um, and milkweeds have a, a number of chemical defenses, including latex, which I think you were talking getting at earlier. Also, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, cardiac glycosides, no, car cardenolides. <laughs> I always mix up which chemicals are in which plant family, but I'm not going to call um, you out on it. <laughs> <laughs> it can, uh, these chemicals can mess with, uh, they, they inhibit, um, sodium potassium pumps. And so they can mess with, uh, um, with everything, uh, your heartbeat, whatever. Um, but, but the channels, the, so the sodium channels and sorry, not sodium potassium pumps, they mess with sodium channels. And so, in monarchs, the sodium channels have a modification so that they are not affected by these chemicals. Um, so basically in all of these cases, the, the butterflies feeding on the plants have the adaptation to deal with the chemical, defensive chemicals in the plants. Um, and so they only feed on those one plants, that, those, one, those plant groups. And if they lay their eggs on something else, then the caterpillars will probably die. That said, there are a handful of species that are really generalized and can feed on 15 to 20 plant families. How they mm. do that, I think, is somewhat of a mystery, um, at least in a number of cases. Um, but uh, to go back to your original question about, you know, well, what is the mom doing in terms of where she's putting her eggs? They're choosing the correct host plant, the plant, the plant that's not going to be toxic to their offspring. And they usually do that by um, tasting the plants. They have little chemoreceptors in their feet. They taste the plants with their feet. And the, there's usually a chemical that they, depending on the species, that they pay attention to that's indicative of a host plant. So for cabbage white butterflies, it's the, the, the chemical that makes mustard taste spicy to us. They taste with their feet. and They're like, oh, this is a host. I'm going to lay an egg on it. And over time, they learn colors and shapes and stuff associated with the plants that are common in that area and they get faster at finding the plants and laying eggs in them. Um, but on top, so yeah. there's a, there's a degree of learning. So, yeah. so there, there's so much because we, we kind of just got done talking about butterflies, you know, you know coming out of the cocoon and just having all of these instincts ready to go yeah. and navigating. I, I almost around. went down the tangent there, but yeah, we can right, go down, right. that, down that road now if you want, but they do sure. learn a bit. They come with, 
innate biases to look for green things and to like a particular taste um, for a host plant, but they will learn additional things, again, depending on the species. Some species mm. learn more than others. Um, and some species will even learn spatial things associated with where their resources are as well. Um, but they are, in butterflies, they're particularly tuned into color. So they will, um, you can take, if you have the chemical of the host plant for a butterfly, you can train them to lay eggs on purple glitter paper if you wanted um, in, a, in the lab. And similarly with a lot of nectar, they're also learning in the, in the feeding context. So they will learn colors associated with particularly rewarding flowers. Some butterflies will learn, some of the really smart butterflies will even learn spatial locations of particularly rewarding flowers and come back to them at particular times. Um, so they are learning a number of things. Hmm. So, um, listen to this smooth transition into your work that I'm about to do. So, um, I, uh, so it's, it's, it's just so fascinating. If, if we talk about evolution quite a bit on this show and I, I love that just, uh, Every, everything seems to get used in, in so many ways, or, or at least it certainly was in the past. And uh, where you have, we started with talking about dung beetles, where we have you know, one species waste is another species uh, home and uh, food resource and everything else and uh, kind of penthouse and how it picks up ladies and everything else. And then, and then you have uh, something that's, that's poisonous to uh, a, a defense for some plants becomes something that you put on a hot dog in another species or <laughs> turn into gloves and make use out of. And there's, there's all these, it seems like there's just so little waste in most uh, natural, I'll use the term loosely, I guess, natural ecosystems and, and s so much uh, finely tuned symbiosis that has been uh, established over uh, you know, billions of years. And then now you have these modern city environments where there's, uh, there's all of these new circumstances where things didn't evolve for to deal with roads or dams or uh it, it, like modern waste that say was maybe dumped into waterways or whatever and and so how does that how does that influence um insects today compared to before uh say the last couple hundred years or i i guess modern civilization is going back 10,000 years ago but it, i i imagine i imagine you can just see change so much more rapidly in uh insect diversity and populations simply because there's so much change within the environment happening um somewhat artificially whatever artificial means yeah i mean so i i love that common thread there and i think you're right on you've hit on you've you've hit on something key that when you look at ecosystems, it doesn't look like there's much waste because we define waste as something we don't want. But that is actually, an, from an evolutionary perspective, something that is waste is an opportunity for some other organism to take advantage of. And so waste doesn't stick around for a long time from an evolutionary perspective because something will evolve to do something with it. And many human environments that have a lot of human waste are kind of the same thing where they are open opportunities for organisms to colonize and use them, whether it's for food, shelter, whatever. Um, and so I think that that's definitely true for urban environments, for human pollution even, for agricultural environments. So these are huge opportunities for organisms uh, huge, almost open, open niches uh, mm. to colonize. And from a scientific perspective, there are also opportunities 
kind of as, as you hinted at to study evolution and action, you know, who, who is thriving in these environments now? Why, how are they changing? Are today's pigeons and house sparrows and, you know, birds that are, and organisms that are doing well in cities, are they the seed of the next evolutionary radiation? Would we come back in 20 million years and find that house sparrows were the ancestor of, you know, a hundred new species <laughs> right. that have now subdivided cities? Um, I don't know. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's just fascinating because most of uh, the narrative that we hear is, uh, and and I think a lot of it's true, but then also a lot of it's just uh, we we tend to weight loss more significantly than gains, and so uh, with with the many uh, issues that come up with environmental problems, at, at least problems from the impact of uh, making. Uh, life potentially harder for humans on earth going forward there's always these opportunities that are created so you you, you hear about something that is absolutely devastating to one species but maybe that species was a, a predator of another species that's now taking off and thriving and and there's there's new opportunities um popping up in in areas that you wouldn't really think of as uh you know, some some natural o a, a kind of oasis in a classical uh, classical sense, where yeah. uh, uh, where obviously a city looks quite a bit different than a jungle, and a jungle is something that we think about of teeming with all sorts of life. And you watch the David Attenborough documentaries and everything else, but uh, pigeons sure are loving city life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. I think the key here is thinking about time and mm -hmm. that's, I don't, I'm not, you know, talking about adaptation to cities or human environments as a justification for the loss of other species, because you can lose species so quickly and it takes a long time for new species to arise. And I mean, you might want to talk to paleontologists about this. This is more less my area of expertise, but if you think back to the most recent mass extinction at the KT boundary when dinosaurs went extinct, and I don't know what proportion of species went extinct, but it was a huge number in a very short mm -hmm. amount of time. And then it took another 60 to 70 million years to, you know, get to have all of these lineages radiate and fill that open niche space. And so do we really want to be so horrible to the world that we lose 80% of our species when we're not going to get them back for another 70 million years? <laughs> Probably yeah, not. but in 70 million <laughs> years, it'll be fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the other problem, the other problem is that, uh, so I don't know if you talked to anybody about evolutionary rescue, but it's this, this idea that, you know, as the environment is stressed, populations decline and and populations can be saved through evolutionary mechanisms if some genetic variation that's there allows you to deal with a new environment and then the population rebounds and that new uh, mutation increases in frequency. That can't happen if the population goes extinct. <laughs> so, Right. You know, evolution can save a population in the face of new environments and environmental change, but only if they don't go extinct. Right, so, right. Um, so there's some sweet spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do a lot of, I don't know if you've heard of the One Health Initiative um, at, all, at all, but I, I do some work with them. Uh -huh. so, so I, I'm, 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 I very much care about all of, yeah. all of these things, but, but it is, but just, <laughs> just from um, the perspective of, of uh, looking at things through a new lens and um, it's, it is, you're you're very rarely going to hear stories about the uh, the big evolutionary winner in uh, you know whatever otherwise environmentally devastating thing that's that's happened. You know, even even if uh, they, like certainly humans don't want to 
don't want to go extinct. We're trying to stop global warming and everything else, but cacti are pretty cool with it. And like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're fine with what's going on. Um, yeah. And so, I think one, one, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say one more observation and sort of contrasting cities versus tropical areas with this point of time is that tropical forests and are just a wealth of biological information because they house so much biodiversity. And that's probably a separate conversation as to why, but there are just, there's so much we can learn from mm -hmm. the species and adaptations there. Mm -hmm. Urban environments are species poor because of this time issue. There hasn't been time for organisms to adapt and radiate and solve problems in lots of different ways. And so they might be inspirational to humans in 70 million years, but now they're, they're not. So we need, you know, that, that to me, that's sort of the, one of the crucial arguments besides ec ecosystem services <laughs> to yeah, yeah. conserve things. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm very pro conversation, conservation, sure of course. I'm sure you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it, it certainly, uh, for your research, uh, speaking of opportunities, for your research, it does seem to, in some ways, create some interesting opportunities, if not troubling ones, where uh, you being in Minneapolis kind of do actually get to see up close and personal what happens when this absolutely novel thing happens to our planet and this uh, how how old are butterflies like how many millions of of years do you do you have any idea i should know that it, 250 million years it's amazing Two, 250 million years and if you think about how much their environment has changed in the last 250 years alone and then and then you think about going back to the beginning of our conversation this unique opportunity within insects to study evolution in the in the scale of our of our lifespan and being able to follow these generations what's a butterfly generation depends on Typically. the butterfly but a month probably a month on average so you get to see these things potentially happen pretty quickly yeah um so so uh, can you talk about that that work that you do? Yeah, so we've been studying adaptation to, well, adaptation and sort of ecological responses to a couple of human environments. Uh, and we can talk about any of them if you want. Um, agricultural environments, urban environments, and roadsides, uh, which are both urban and agricultural. They're everywhere. Roads are everywhere. Uh, and they're all kind of different um, in terms of how, how the environments are different from historical environments. And they're all kind of different in how evolution might happen um, because of sort of their spatial structure. So I don't know, which which one do you want to go with first? Or well, I, the, I guess I, I guess roadsides would have never been on my radar. I guess I would have never thought of that as a different uh ecological environment the the agriculture and urban environments kind of seems like an intuitive place to go and that's we've talked about some of those environments in the past but uh you don't hear too much about um roadside environments yeah so well maybe let's talk about the ecology of roadsides first before we talk about mm. the evolution because they're kind of weird from an evolutionary perspective uh from an ecology perspective, roads are interesting. They're different from a nutritional perspective because you've got uh, you've got elevated some elevated macronutrients from exhaust like nitrogen, but you also have elevated mm. you have some elevated micronutrients in the upper Midwest or in the northern climates from salt from road salt. If you have higher mm. sodium, mm. both of those are things that are usually limited and herbivore diets might actually attract herbivores. Well, in some cases we know they attract, like salt attracts moose and stuff to roadsides. Um, but then you also have elevated toxins from roadsides and also adjacent land use. So you have elevated heavy metals. In a lot of cases, the salt can get to toxic levels. Uh, sometimes you'll get pesticide spillover from adjacent agriculture. 
So nutritionally, they're kind of a weird environment. But then from a risk perspective, they're also really different because of cars. You've got, in some ways, cars are like a novel predator for a lot of insects or anything <laughs> using a roadside. They're a novel predator. That, in terms of like a, like we've all seen in the car wash, basically, like a, the, just a bug splats all over, all over well, the yeah, vehicle. Yeah. Is that what you mean? I mean, and because they're not, they're not like any other predator they've seen historically. They're really fast. They don't, you know, they, they're a lot less predictable than in some ways than other predators, but they're more predictable in other ways because they're always on the road. Mm hmm but they're not predictable in that you don't necessarily know when they're coming. There's uh, whereas, no like theory of mind that could evolve to predict a car. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, but maybe if you know, you could listen for them or there, there are, there are cues associated with them that they can detect. Um, so from a risk perspective, they're really different as well. And mm. um, so you can ask, you know, how, so in a way, it is, it is a novel environment, but it presents opportunities because from an ecological point of view, because their roadsides are everywhere. They're often, sometimes they're actually safer from natural predators. Uh, you know, if you think about in the middle of a clover leaf near a bird nesting, you're probably not going to have that much predation from a raccoon that doesn't want to cross the road. Um, so and they, in some cases, can present opportunities. They also are corridors that often will connect core pieces of habitat. Um, and so, you know, you can ask, well, what organisms are exploiting that opportunity? How are they doing it? Or is it just a sink? Is it just a habitat that's attracting things because it's habitat, but all of the risks and associated toxins are just killing everything that's there. Um, and so I think those are really interesting questions. And then you can step back and ask, well, what is this doing from an evolutionary perspective and are organisms adapting to roadsides? And could you ever end up with a specialist on a roadside? Um, I'm not sure you could, but, uh, but because Here's where it gets weird from an evolutionary perspective. Roads are, when we think about sort of evolutionary models of adaptation to one thing or another, we often think about, you know, adapting to this area or the adjacent area and different populations and they're changing to, to adapt to those two different areas. But you don't have areas. Roadsides are not one place or another. Roads are everywhere and roadsides are distributed in a way that there you need to add some degree of behavioral choice into an evolutionary model, which also happens because organisms will adapt to, say, host plants. And even though host plants are distributed everywhere, they're adapting to those host plants because they have a behavioral preference and a choice for that host plant. So in order to get adaptation to a roadside where you're evolving to be specialized to a roadside, you'd have to couple some behavioral choice for the roadside um, into that process. So it gets complicated. And I don't mm. think anybody has shown that. <laughs> but hmm. um but but theoretically if if something can make good use of say gravel or uh roadkill or or something like that well well avoiding through maybe listening for sound or only only doing these things at night and running when you see light or something like that uh it, it, there there could be some opportunity for exploitation yes yes and and there certainly are a lot of, you know, case studies, not just in insects, but in, in a number of vertebrates as well, of organ of animals exploiting roadsides, whether it's roadkill or high salt or nesting on bridges. And sometimes they do that through learning and learning to avoid cars or learning to cross at low traffic times or just avoiding crossing at all. Um, and there are a handful of examples of population level changes, adaptations to roads as well. There's some swallow examples where that looks like there are changes in wing morphology um, mm -hmm. and wing shape to avoid cars. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the, there, I don't know how much you followed the insect apocalypse uh, 
discussions, but there, there were a number of studies talking about how insects are declining. And one of the studies used windshield bug hits as a indicator for declines in insects. Oh, um, fascinating. Of course. Yeah, That's, that makes sense in some ways. It does. But there's a, there's been some huge criticisms of that study, All in right. part that there are aerodynamic changes in cars that should reduce those bug hits over time ah. and there's a if insects are adapting at all to avoid mm. cars which i wouldn't be surprised if they are to some extent um then it should also decline over time but i would say that's a huge area of open research you know whether they are adapting to avoid cars um and it could be through changes in changes in sensing the cars it could be changes in in wing morphology to avoid the cars uh, and it probably d depends on species because different species have very different sort of aerial adaptations to dealing with predators um, for example monarchs and a lot of uh, chemically defended butterflies have they've been shown to have what's been called nonchalant flight where they're distasteful to most of the vertebrates that would pluck them out of the air. So they just don't care. They're just flying around, whatever. And so you might expect evolutionary responses to avoid cars to be very different in a species with nonchalant flight than a species that's evolved to fly around and be hyper vigilant of what's about to eat it. They're mm. probably going to be much better at dealing with cars. Mm. But who knows? That's a totally open research question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's uh that that is it's it's fascinating to think i mean the the I, again going back to theory of mind the uh, the difference between something being vigilant of a bird swooping down to eat it which that bird has the intention to eat it and uses its own strategies which are patterns that can be picked up on to, so that you could have uh, uh, evolve evasive maneuvers or ways to hide or whatever else or wings that make you mimic or blend in or but uh but cars just feel so much more random in that in that particular way right. whereas whereas uh it, a car as a predator is not uh it, it is not intentionally right. predating it has no intention. yeah yeah uh, so in some ways it should be easier to evolve a way to avoid that because there's no way they're going to get an arms an evolutionary arms race with the car right right um but there's still that step of you know learning to recognize and then or evolving the ability to recognize and then avoiding but I do think, so that, that also reminded me, there are some really interesting comparative studies in birds that suggest that bigger brain species are sort of pre-adapted to dealing with cars and that they can avoid getting hit because hmm. they have the cognitive abilities to recognize and learn that they are dangerous. Um, well, you, you would certainly think that there was probably quite a bit of weeding out. Maybe I'm thinking about this wrong and maybe that... It, it's, it might not be true at all, but you would you would think when Windows first started popping up, it was just such a novel to to have to have a solid, transparent, th never never in these billions of years on life on this planet or in however long birds have been, however many millions of years birds have been around, did they need to consider? What if I just slam into a transparent barrier? And you would think that evolution would have, for birds in urban environments, would have had to figure out cues to uh, to look for, whether it's glare or just a structure being around uh, that that space to avoid or or whatever else. But um, that it, it it's weird to think of how how birds in such a short amount of time did adapt to avoiding windows. They obviously still slam into them once in a while. Yeah, they do. I don't know of any studies looking at evolutionary change and detecting windows, but I, I agree with you. I, I would be surprised As if a something metaphor, hasn't happened. You know, um, right. and, and, and an analogous example is um, polarized light detection in insects, that a lot of insects use polarized light to find water 
And that's why sometimes you'll see mayflies and other big swarms of insects on dark colored cars or windows. And those mm. are huge selective events because they think they're finding water to mate, but then they end up dying on a big skyscraper window. Mm. And so um, I would guess that there's some, there's got to be some population. <laughs> there's got to be some selection happening there to right. use some other cues besides just polarized light to find water because humans make a lot of things that polarize light but are not water. Yeah, that, it's it's. I mean, you you think you see these kind of uh, uh, sad examples on nature documentaries of of uh, turtles laying on the beach and uh, or turtle eggs hatching on a hatching on a beach and using the moon as a cue to get to water, but yeah. the, uh, uh, seeing the city light and having these kind of uh, basic sensory adaptations to just hey, if you see this. Uh, if you see a big light at night, walk towards it and then going into the city rather than going to the water and, and dying that way. Insects must face those sorts of pressures all the time with artificial light, as we're all familiar with yeah. insects collecting around. And yep. and uh, and uh, I, I suppose fires were more dominant in the past. But um, the, and so you, you would think that would have to have where where. Um, you know, in the in the past, the 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 turtle that just happened to have the instinct to walk the other <laughs> way away from the light would have been something that was like objectively in kind of an error in a way it is now an adaptation where uh, doing the exact opposite of everything that would have served it well in the millions of years in the past is now the 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 preference that's going to be passed on and going to be the most successful in our modern environment. Right. Yeah. Selection all depends on the environment that it's in. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So in, in, in terms of, in, in terms of the, uh, on my other podcast, uh, Mind Under Matter, we recently had some episodes about the Red Queen hypothesis and been talking about evolutionary arms races with, uh, we just did a pandemic history episode and talking about host virus uh, arms races and things. I, that that must apply. I would think that some of these, some of the arms races that you see in insects interacting with a modern life are uh, really represented in agricultural environments, uh, right? With, with pesticides and, and such. So, yeah. So humans, I think in an agricultural setting are definitely in an arms race with a lot of pest species and trying to outwit them and prevent them from evolving resistance to whatever toxins they're using. And, and you see the same thing in antibiotic use. Um, and I think, mm -hmm. you know, we have a variety of tricks up our sleeve in terms of, uh, you know, using multiple chemicals and alternating them. And so that way it reduces the chance of the population adapting to it or using biocontrol so that you are now using an agent that is also evolving and can keep up with the pest that you're trying to control. Um, right. Like, so are you talking about like genetically modified things? Uh, uh, no, I'm talking, sorry. I, I, I'm talking about in introducing, if you have an invasive pest, trying to find a matched predator from oh, the natural range and introducing that. So that you establish some degree of biological control and then your control agent, whether it's a predator or disease is now also evolving. So you're not, that's different from making a pesticide where, you know, the pesticide is not evolving. We're just making it in a factory. It's, a, it's mm -hmm. evolving if we decide to change it chemically. But mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, hmm. I don't remember what the original question was, but <laughs> um, it, it, it was <laughs> arms it, it, no, just just a, yeah, arms races, just a general conversation about arms races in, in, in terms of agriculture. And I, I know just from in terms of uh you know, we, we have a lot of human listeners. We might have some 
cats and dogs listening <laughs> as as well but um and humans tend to care about you know how how this stuff kind of impacts them in one of those arms races it does have to do with pesticides a, a bit because there's the uh there's um tolerance that can be built in insects and and adding more yep. it, it, and there's so there's a lot of uh, antibiotic resistance is something people are, are becoming more aware of because of uh, uh, because of everything going on with a pandemic right now. And there's uh, some people have a misunderstanding of uh, thinking vaccines kind of do the vaccines are a very different uh, thing that aren't that aren't triggering this kind of antibiotic yeah. resistance and in the same way and um, and uh, potentially compromising uh immune systems and stuff that antibiotics sometimes do in that same way there's uh, uh this this may not be something that you know anything about or care to talk about but is there i'm kind of pro genetically modified uh, crops for for this very reason i don't i just don't like the idea of pesticides and stuff with food and it seems like genetically modifying things seems like a really um great or introducing predators predators seems like a way of getting the same result without um uh, well eliminating some of the need for pesticide yeah so i agree with that sometimes i think that genetically modifying so for instance introducing bt into into things and making it toxic to the pests would reduce your insecticide application However, other genetically modified things actually increase insecticide use. So mm -hmm. making your crops, genetically modifying your crops to resist Roundup means you can now spray the heck out of your fields uh. and kill everything except for your crop. And that has been hypothesized to be one of the major reasons why you've had a decline in monarchs in the last That's two decades. That's interesting. Because that kills all of the milkweed within the crop and often adjacent to the crop and lots of other non-crop um, mm. species. And so um, I think it depends a lot on the, <laughs> um, what, what the intention is with the, right. with the modification from, right. Right. from the onset. Right. And, and the, the BT thing, it, it, I would say it's more nuanced as well because BT, I believe is technically classified as an organic because it's a toxin produced by a bacteria, it is classified as organic. And so it can be used in an organic setting, but it still kills lots of insects. And um, so even, so I mean, I've had a number of experiment, experiments where I went out and bought organic cabbage to feed butterflies and it killed the butterflies because it wasn't organic from my perspective. <laughs> um, right. So, you mean so they I, don't? <laughs> the, the, it wasn't rigorously uh, regulated, and yeah, they maybe yeah. just threw the word organic. Well, I on guess there they can to... do that too. Although I think my understanding is that those regulations are pretty stringent for um, getting the organic certification. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's that's um, reassuring to know. Yeah, I, uh, I've always been suspicious of that. <clears throat> yeah, the and i think there are a lot of you know, there are a lot of sustainable farming practices that cannot get that classification because of because it is so stringent but they're mm. still pretty ecologically good and sustainable hmm. um I, that's I'm, I'm definitely happy not that my you brought area that of expertise up. but oh, yeah it's, <laughs> well, i said i'm happy that you brought that up because i i would have uh i, I would have thought otherwise yeah but I, I mean, I think that the whole field of synthetic biology in general, where you're not just genetically modifying organisms, but you're sometimes synthesizing entire cells and making organisms in new ways. I think it has a lot of potential if you can make sure it doesn't spread. And mm -hmm. That's the problem with creating life is that it can take over. Um, and right, so, right. Uh, uh, you know, there's some evidence of genetically modified crops also spilling over into natural populations. And so that's another area mm. of concern um, with I genetically see. modified organisms. But in terms of a nutrition perspective, you know, because I know some people think that they're healthier, that's not necessarily true. 
Yeah, right. Um, yeah. yeah, I I just I uh, that that's all. I, I guess my my bias was uh, away from the uh, GMO panic that is pop, or or at least kind of the the yeah. premises being used in in terms of it being unhealthy or something because right. it's it's always yes. there's there's some. Uh, I think the University of Nebraska a few years ago did a survey asking public about like concern the, the uh, food and agriculture department did a survey asking about people's concerns and something like 80% of Americans surveyed. I actually don't think it was a huge sample. It was like a thousand people or something, but 80% of people um, believed that uh that we should be labeling food that contains dna oh yes i remember seeing that <laughs> yeah that was kind of concerning sci yeah. science literacy in this yeah. country has a little ways to yeah. go um but uh well okay cool well let's talk about uh, before i let you go um uh, uh, you've been such a great guest could we could we talk about some of your work with urban environments sure yeah yeah, so I'm, uh, maybe we can talk about some of my past work and I'm happy to talk about some of the current work too. The, you steer the ship. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm really interested in, in how human environments affect selection on cognition. And so I actually think this is relevant to agricultural environments as well, because agricultural environments, you're basically creating a giant predictable environment. And that should select as once an organism can colonize that environment, it should select against cognition. And in many ways, you would then be breeding a stupid, highly reproductive pest species if you had like a monoculture and agricultural environment. This is kind of it's it's sort of a use it or lose it thing that you see a lot yes. of places in evolution when exactly. when the, say going back to kind of these arms races and red queen stuff you have you have some incredibly sophisticated prey that's adapted all of these defenses and and uh, ways to recognize and evade predation and all these and then the predator in the environment goes away and then generations later it's just the all of those costly defenses that no it hasn't needed in a very long time and it doesn't it doesn't have those skills anymore and then a, a new predator that same predator gets reintroduced and uh and that equilibrium is is offset once again yeah so cities are a really interesting environment because they're drastically different than what organisms have experienced in the past in terms of the resources in terms of the risks in terms of the, even the habitat structure um <clears throat> but once you're there they are in some ways predictable and do in some ways affect uh, represent an opportunity there's there's food there, there's, there are places to nest on buildings, their cars stick to streets. So the question is, you know, what organisms can colonize that place? How do they do it? And then once they're there, what happens? And so we, um, a few, a few years ago, I don't know, almost 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, we did a study using the mammal collection here to look at a time series of, of cognitive capacity using um, skull brain case volumes as sort of a proxy for cognition. And we predicted that at least in birds, there's really good evidence that species, larger brain species, not only are they better at you know, figuring out that they need to avoid a car, but they are better at colonizing cities. And <clears throat> We were interested in whether you would see a signature of selection of this sort of increased selection on cognition within a species as they start to colonize and do well in a city and urbanization spreads to do, do mammals show an increase in, in cognitive capacity. And we, we did see that for a, a subset of mammals that we studied um, when you did spatial comparisons, the urban populations had larger cranial capacities than the rural populations, but the time series actually wasn't there in the urban populations. If anything, it was reversed. And so 
But, but, uh, sorry, time series. Can you explain? So we that? looked over, you know, over a hundred year period. Mm-hmm. Are is cranial capacity increasing in these urban mammals? Right. And right. the answer is no. And okay. so, in fact, it was increasing in the rural populations and all of the insect feeding species we worked on. And so, <clears throat> I can speculate as to so, why I think that is. But so, so on, on the surface, my interpretation of that would would be that uh, that these larger brain cities are able to exploit cities, but exploiting cities isn't making them smarter. Um. Well, but the urban populations had larger cranial capacities than the rural populations. So what I'm <clears throat> so this is within a species. Mm-hmm. So the way we interpret it is that there was some selection on cognition a long time ago, probably in the 1800s. And we missed that selection event because we don't have samples that go back that far. But since then, there's probably been no further selection on cognition. If anything, there's now a decline. Um, once they're there, they're fine. Uh, there's, a, there's no selection for increased cognition once they're there. Um, mm. and, and in the rural populations, it seems like over the last 80 years, there has been increased selection on cognition in bats and shrews. And there we think it's probably because they're being forced to go over larger areas to find enough food. Um, so I'm really interested in sort of urban environments and cognition. We tried to get a bunch of work funded on mice to do that more and never got it funded. So I kind of moved on from the cognition question. And a lot of our current urban work is thinking about which species do well with urban toxins and why. And so here we're looking at, we're looking at bees and we're also looking at butterflies and asking, for example, in butterflies, how does, Evolution and evolutionary history with plant toxins cannot basically pre-adapt you to deal with novel toxins in urban environments. This goes back to your arms race question. If you've been in an arms race with plants that have been trying to outwit you for millions of years, do you have some kind of broad adaptations to deal with a range of different chemicals that they throw at you and such that even if a human throws a new chemical at you, you can deal with it? In the pesticide world, there is evidence that species that have an evolutionary history with more plant toxins are more likely to evolve resistance to a new pesticide. And so the idea here is that you basically have uh, physiological defenses to deal with new toxins. And so we're going to test that in urban environments, mostly around metals, but a couple of, of other toxins as well. Hmm. Um, and, and what kind of, uh, what kind of research do you have, uh, coming up related that you're kind of the most excited about? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work and uh, we'll continue this year and next year, just collecting a bunch of different butterfly and bee species from across the Twin Cities um, urban core to rural areas and looking at toxin accumulation, mostly heavy metals, but we're also starting to look at microplastics um, in their bodies and then taking a number of sort of measures of their health uh, and then looking at that across different species, how do different traits, can you, can you predict who's going to do well and tolerate a bunch of different toxins in their body? Um, mm. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm I'm particularly excited about that work, uh, and a piece of that also has to do with how urban restoration can remediate those same toxins. Um, so if you can understand how a certain planting affects the insects there and the worms there, and how how does that then affect how heavy metals move around, can you use that to remediate areas of urban pollution that are low but still of concern in terms of chronic exposure like to lead but they might not be high enough to trigger you know epa intervention or something like that um so we're starting to do some work on urban pollinator plantings and how that affects worms and how that affects 
how worms move heavy metals into the deeper into the soil and whether that could be beneficial to humans. Um, so I'm really excited about that work. Fantastic. Well, you've you've been an awesome guest. Thanks so much for joining me today. This is really fun. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. This has been a really fun conversation. Yeah, and uh, it, 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 this is, uh, I hope to have you back on again sometime. Um, once again, uh, Emily Snell Road, or, sorry, Emily Snell Road, everybody. I'm the worst with names. I always screw up something. <laughs> and um, yeah, and if, if people want to find out more about your work, can uh, where can they find it? Well, Snell Road is a very Googleable name. It's just me and my <laughs> sister. So. S N E L L R O O D. Yep. H- hyphen R O O D. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you for joining me, and thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you more next week. <laughs>